Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our prosthodontic series. And this video is going to be about mandibular edentulous anatomy to continue our discussion of the edentulous anatomy and why it's so important to formulating and fabricating dentures. So here we have the mandibular alveolar ridge. We had an upper alveolar ridge and now we have the lower. And it's typically less broad than the maxillary ridge. And that's important when we're fabricating the denture. You'll notice some other familiar terms. We talked about a labial frenum in the maxillary arch. And we again have a labial frenum in the mandibular arch. And it's again located at or just by the midline for the patient. Now you'll notice I included this italicized term, it's orbicularis oris, which is a facial muscle that encircles the lips. So now we have to remember for the board exam some muscles that attach into these frenum, these bands of tissue here. So the orbicularis oris muscle attaches to the labial frenum, whereas there is no muscle attachment in the maxillary labial frenum. We again have the buccal frena. There's one on the patient's right side and one on the patient's left side. And again, they're off to the sides, they're associated with the cheeks, and they have some muscles that attach into them. They have the orbicularis oris muscle and the buccinator muscle. And this is actually true for the maxillary buccal frenum as well. So they have the same muscle attachments for upper and lower, so it's pretty nice and symmetrical. Now we have the introduction of a frenum that's unique to the mandibular anatomy, and that's because it's associated with the tongue, and that is the lingual frenum. And you can see it very clearly in this image. Again, it's going to be right along the midline for that patient, and it runs from the, the ridge all the way to its connection to the tongue on the ventral surface. And we have the genioglossus muscle, which is attaching into this frenum. So the mandibular anatomy is a little bit more involved than the maxillary anatomy because now we have these pesky muscles to memorize for the board exam. But luckily, they all make sense based on their location. So next, we still have the same vestibules. We have the labial vestibule which again is running from buccal frenum to buccal frenum. So that's the space between the ridge and the labial mucosa and the lips. And this time I introduced a muscle that's going to be forming the inferior border for this vestibule. So the mentalis muscle, you know, associated with the chin area, is attaching to this ridge in the labial vestibule. So the, again, the inferior border of that vestibule is limited based on how high the mentalis muscle is attaching to the ridge. Likewise, for the buccal vestibule, we have the buccinator muscle that's attaching to the ridge. And again, the buccal vestibule is everything posterior to the buccal frenum. And that would be the space that's formed between the ridge and the buccal mucosa and the cheeks. So when we talk about denture flanges, we'll talk about the flange being the extension of the denture into the vestibule area. It's important where these muscles are attaching to the ridge because that'll define how long our flange can extend into the vestibule. All right, now we have another unique structure. This is the retromolar pad. And like the hamular notch, it defines the posterior boundary of the buccal vestibule. So the retromolar pad not only marks the posterior boundary of the buccal vestibule, it also marks the distal extension of the alveolar or the edentulous ridge. So the retromolar pad is going to be at the distal extension of the edentulous ridge. So in these areas that I'm showing here. So the retromolar pad is a nice uh, sensical name because it's behind where the molars would have been, hence retromolar. And if the patient still had their teeth, then the 
retro molar pad would be in the same area. It would be behind or distal to the terminal molars on both sides. So this structure is ideally covered for support and retention since the integrity of the bone in this area is maintained. So what I mean by that is that the denture, the lower denture, would ideally cover that area of the ridge because it's a very stable and sturdy region. And that's because it contains attachments from four different structures that you should definitely know for the board exam. And that is the temporalis muscle, the buccinator muscle, the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle, and the pterygomandibular raphe. Now remember in the last video, we talked, um, talked for a couple of minutes about the pterygomandibular raphe, and that's a band of tissue that connects to the buccinator muscle anteriorly and the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle posteriorly. So you'll notice just going through that anatomy is three out of the four structures that attaches to the retromolar pad. So that's hopefully a helpful way to remember most of those. So next we have the masseteric notch, which is not so much an anatomical structure as it is a landmark for the impressions and the dentures. So you might see, you might find this a little bit familiar, and that's because this is basically analogous to the coronoid notch of the upper denture, which referred to the distobuccal area on the upper impression or denture. So the masseteric notch now refers to the distobuccal area on the lower impression or denture, and it's marked off right here. And the reason it's called the masseteric notch is because the masseter is what's going to be interfering with that area. And the masseter, which runs here, contracts when the mouth closes against resistance. So if we were to leave this area overextended on the denture, it would both irritate the patient and could potentially lead to dislodging of the dentures during function. So when you're border molding and taking that uh, final impression for the dentures, you'd have the patient close against some resistance because this is when the masseter is contracting and would flatten this area of the impression. So it's, sort, it's very similar to the coronoid notch because that when we were border molding for the patient, we'd want their mandible to go left and right so that coronoid notch would swipe the area of the impression in the distobuccal corner. So here we're having the patient contract, we're having the patient close against resistance so the masseter contracts and flattens that area of the denture so we make sure it's not overextended. All right, next we have the alveololingual sulcus. And this is a very important structure on the board exam, so we're gonna go into quite a bit of detail for this. And it's located between the mandibular alveolar ridge and the tongue. So you can think of it sort of like the lingual vestibule and it would run from the lingual frenum posteriorly. And just like there are two S's in the word sulcus, there are two S's in this anatomical structure, and I wanna make sure that we learn them. So one of the S's is evident in this aerial view here. And so if we take a look and we trace the alveololingual sulcus, we can see how it starts and it goes in to start, in laterally away from the midline, and then it kind of bumps out a little bit medially towards the midline, and then goes back in laterally away from the midline. So that's the first S that we're gonna talk about. And you can see that the flange of the denture, again, that's the extension into the vestibule area, follows this same S, in, out, and in. So you can see how those nicely correspond to each other from the patient's anatomy to the denture. All right, so the alveololingual sulcus has three regions. 
and for lack of a better term, they're called anterior region, the middle region, and the posterior region. So we'll start with the anterior region. And this runs from the lingual frenum to the premylohyoid fossa. And the premylohyoid fossa is sort of an ancient term, but we may need to know this terminology for the board exam, so I left it here just in case. The premylohyoid fossa is where the mylohyoid curves below the sulcus. So this is the mylohyoid line here. This image really nicely details the mylohyoid ridge or line, which is where the mylohyoid muscle attaches to the mandible. So the fossa would be this area here that's sort of in front of the mylohyoid line. So I can draw the boundaries. It's a little bit unclear where the lingual frenum might be for looking maybe somewhere around here. And so you can think of the anterior region going from there all the way to you know, somewhere around here. Okay, so we have the premylohyoid pre fossa, and you'll notice that the sublingual gland, it's showing the sublingual fossa right around here, is sitting above the mylohyoid line, and that's because the sublingual gland does in fact sit above the mylohyoid muscle in this region. So the flange of the denture is going to be shorter in the anterior region and should actually touch the mucosa of the floor of the mouth. And so the flange has to be shorter because of the gland in this area. So if we go over to our picture of the denture, this would be the anterior region associated with the alveololingual sulcus, and that area, this flange running through here, is going to be shorter because of the sublingual gland sitting above the mylohyoid muscle. So next we have the middle region, and that runs from the pre-mylohyoid fossa, which we just talked about, to the distal end of the mylohyoid ridge. So we'll draw in our line again here for the anterior region, and we'll say it ends around here, and this would, this would include the middle region for the alveololingual sulcus. So you can think of it basically running the, the, from the beginning to the end of the mylohyoid line. And the mylohyoid muscle is an important muscle, and it runs from the mandible below where the molars are, and actually the mylo of mylohyoid is referring to molars, and it runs from this to the hyoid bone, and it's responsible for elevating the hyoid bone and the tongue during swallowing and speaking. So the flange of the denture is going to be deflected medially away from the mandible, and so that means it would be coming out of the screen towards you, and that coordinates with where the myeloid hyoid ridge bulges out. So, and also, not only is the ridge prominent, but the mylohyoid muscle contracts medially in this area. So you can see this area of the denture is coming out towards the midline, and that's, again, corresponding to where this mylohyoid ridge bulges out on the mandible. And lastly, we have the posterior region, which extends into the retromylohyoid fossa. So we had a pre, and now we have a retro. And so we can draw that, and it's basically everything distal to the end of this mylohyoid line. So that would be the posterior region of the alveololingual sulcus. And although the mylohyoid attaches higher the more posteriorly you go, the posterior muscle fibers are directed more vertically rather than horizontally. So the denture can seat deeper and the lingual flange is actually longer in this area. So the flange can sit deeper down in the posterior region because of the vertical orientation of the mylohyoid muscle fibers in this region. Not only that, but the flange is deflected laterally towards the ramus, and you can see how in this posterior region, the flange comes back to the lateral direction. 
and it's towards the ramus. So again, that's into the screen now. And it forms that typical S form of the lingual sulcus that we talked about at the beginning. So we went in in the anterior region, we came out in the middle region due to the mylohyoid ridge, and then we went back in as the ridge went away and we had more space to work with towards the ramus. So the denture extension in this area is limited by the palatoglossus and superior constrictor muscles, and if you were to impinge on those, you would cause a sore throat for the patient and other irritations. So you can tell how the muscles are really important and that they define the borders of the denture, how far down you can go, how far back you can go. So those are important to know for that reason. So to review, the flange follows two S's. There's the one here from the anterior region, uh, from the aerial view that we talked about before, and there's one that we've covered but I haven't shown on this image from the side view, and that's that it starts out short based on where the sublingual gland is, and then it can come down in the posterior region where the, the fibers of the mylohyoid muscle run more vertically. So the flange has to start out short and then it can get longer as you go posteriorly. So if you remember those two S's and why the flange is designed in such a way to uh, appreciate the muscles and the bone structure of the mandible, you'll remember all you need to know for the board exam concerned with the alveololingual sulcus. And last, we're going to talk about the buccal shelf. And there are lots of labels on this image. Uh, it can seem overwhelming, but we talked about most, if not all, of these. And so you can see the alveololingual sulcus, again, between the ridge and the tongue. And so we had the pre-mylohyoid fossa, where the denture went in, mylohyoid ridge, where it came out, and then the retromylohyoid fossa, where it went back in again. And then, of course, we have the retromolar pad, which was the distal extension of the ridge, defining where the buccal vestibule is ending. And now we have the buccal shelf, which is just lateral to the posterior mandibular alveolar ridge. And it's this flat landing area that provides support for the denture. And it's, it's flat, so it lies perpendicular to occlusal forces, which makes it an ideal structure for supporting a denture. And the buccinator attaches here. Like I talked about before, the buccinator is attaching at the base of the buccal vestibule, which is where the buccal shelf would be. All right, and that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful in tying everything together for Edentialist Anatomy. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.